And so I, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 2. And we're, this, is our, um, this has been our main passage throughout the month of November. Acts chapter 2 and specifically verse 42. And this is where Luke lists the, the four things that the early church has devoted themselves to. So let's, let's read that again. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, and this is the, in the NLT. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to... Week one, we covered the apostles' teachings, right? And this is, of course, the Word of God. They devoted themselves to the study of the Word of God and to fellowship. And Pastor Timothy spoke on this on the second week. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. And this is what we touched on last week, right? And finally, the last thing, and to prayer. So this morning, we're going to be looking at, at prayer and specifically, why was it so important for the early church, right? And what, why did they devote themselves to prayer? And so when it comes to prayer, right, this is obviously, you know, there's, there's, this is something that we are all familiar with here at church, right? And when it comes to prayer, there are a lot of uh, different ways that we can go about it, right? There's a lot of uh, different sermons that I could preach on the topic of prayer, you know, what to pray about, how to pray, and all of that stuff. But this morning... I want to specifically focus on prayer in a corporate setting, okay? Prayer in a corporate setting. Well, so what does that mean, right? Corporate prayer. Does that mean that we pray at work, right, in a corporate setting? Um, You know, what does that mean? And so a corporate setting or prayer, a corporate prayer uh, just simply means praying together in a group, right? Praying together in a group. And so let's remind ourselves, uh, like I said, there's, there's many different ways that we could have taken this sermon when it comes to prayer, but let us remind ourselves, what is prayer and why is it so important to our faith? Why is it so important to us, uh, you know, as, as Christians, as believers? And so the simplest definition and the, the, that we could give about what prayer is, it is simply talking to God, right? Nothing too complicated. Prayer is we are simply talking to God. God. Prayer is our direct line of communication with God. Amen? Isn't that amazing that we have a God that we can go directly to? You know, we don't have to go through, you know, a a middleman or so to speak. We can go directly to our God. And how do we do that? Through prayer. And so there is no doubt, right, based on the, the, the examples that we see in the Bible and what the Bible teaches us, Prayer is something that every believer should do. Amen? Prayer is something that all of us here as believers should do. And so what do we pray for? What do we pray about? Philippians 4, 6-7, it says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And so what should we pray for as believers? According to Philippians, we should be praying about anything and everything. Amen? We should be praying for the things that we need. We should be praying uh, in bad times. We should be praying in good times. We should be praying simply about anything and everything. There's no limit to what we, we can pray for. And so, now that we know what do we pray for, or what should we pray for, how often should we pray? First Thessalonians 5.17 simply says, Never stop praying. Other translations say, Pray without Ceasing, right? So right there. Never stop praying. Never or pray without ceasing. So how often should we pray? All the time, right? We should be constantly communicating and talking to God throughout our day. So that means we don't just wait till breakfast, lunch, and dinner to pray, right? That doesn't mean that means that we don't just pray only in the morning or only right before we go to bed, or hopefully not. Hopefully we're not waiting till we get to church, right, or Bible study to pray. But we should be in constant communication with God. So we should be praying all the time. And I want to, uh, before we get deeper into this sermon, I want to take this time just to encourage everyone here, do not be intimidated to pray. 
Amen? Don't be intimidated to pray. I know, right? We, sometimes when we pray in a group or somebody asks us to pray, you know, sometimes, you know, our heart sinks and we're like, oh, we freeze up and, you know, we think that we have to say all of these fancy words, all of these, you know, theological words, you know, all of these things, or we're worried about how we sound. Do not be intimidated to pray. I want to encourage us all here that when we pray, just simply talk to God. Share with Him. Talk to Him about what is on your heart, what is on your mind. Tell Him how you feel. Tell Him about what your needs are. Tell Him that you, that you are that you're thankful and grateful to Him for all that He does. So don't be intimidated to pray. Next time somebody asks you to pray, don't worry about how you're going to sound. Simply talk to God. Amen? And I want to encourage that because, you know, sometimes as, as Christians, you know, we have this tendency to, like, use prayer as a punishment, right? We're like, oh, the last one inside the sanctuary is going to pray, or the last one to the table is going to pray for the food. And what happens? Everybody starts, you know, running as fast as we can because we want to avoid praying. But that should not be our mindset. Prayer is a privilege, amen? Think about this. We get to talk to God. We, as God's creation, we get to talk to Him, the Creator. And so the next time somebody says to the last person there is going to have to pray, you better walk slow. Crawl to the, the kitchen, right? Everybody should be fighting to be the last one to, to get there so that we can pray because prayer is a privilege. It's something that we should not take for granted. It's something we should do and not be afraid of doing. Amen? When we pray, it strengthens our faith. It strengthens our relationship with God. Amen? Amen? And why is prayer so important? Because like I said, this is our direct line of communication to God. Now think about this. We can't build a meaningful relationship with someone if we don't talk to them. If we don't communicate with them, right? Now think about, for those of us who are married, when we were courting our, 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 you know, our wives or our husband or vice versa, we wouldn't be, get to that point where we would get married if we didn't talk to each other, right? And think about that. Or any relationship, any meaningful relation, whether it's a friend, a coworker, or a family member, we can't build a meaningful relationship without talking to them. And so our faith is not going to grow. Our relationship with God won't grow if we don't talk to Him, if we don't pray to Him or communicate with Him daily, all the time. Amen? When we pray, we are also demonstrating our faith and our dependence in God. When we pray, what are we doing? We are declaring that God is God. Amen? We are putting things into perspective. When we pray, right, we, we put all of our situations and our lives in perspective, and we are saying that we have a God who created us, who loves us, and only He can answer what I am praying for. And so that is another importance of prayer, that it puts things into perspective. And when we pray, we declare that He is God and recognize who He is and what He is capable of doing. And so we are called to pray. So pray all of the time. Pray anywhere. Pray about anything. And so we know, right, that we are called to pray. And so we know that we have to pray on our own, individually, privately. We pray when we wake up. We pray you know, at home when we're driving to work, right? Just don't close your eyes when you're driving. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel, right? But, uh, you know, <laughs> don't go drive. But uh, we pray about, we, we have to have a personal prayer life. You know, we talk about having a prayer closet and, and, and all of these things. So we know that prayer is important to us individually uh, as believers and it's something that we should be doing as individuals and privately. Our faith depends on prayer. But as important as it is for us to pray on our own, to pray privately, it is equally important that we pray corporately. Amen? Let me say that again. As, as important as it is for us to pray individually, it is equally important for us to pray corporately or to pray together, to pray in a group or to pray with others. You know, even before the events in Acts chapter 2, before the Holy Spirit came and, and the church was founded, the very earliest believers were already praying together. And we're going to look at some examples. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. So this is before Acts chapter 2. 
It says here in Acts 1.14, it says, They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. So they were, before the church was founded in Acts chapter 2, they were already united in prayer, the believers. And in Acts 1, 24 through 25, when they were praying for Judas's replacement, it says, Then they all prayed, O Lord, <clears throat> you know every heart. Show us which one of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in his ministry, where he has deserted us and, and gone where he belongs. And so right here, they were praying together for God's guidance, for his wisdom on, on a replacement uh, for, for Judas. And so from these verses and, and from reading Acts chapter 2, we can see that praying together was valued by the early church, by the early believers. And it says there in, in, in verse 42 that they were devoted to it. They were devoted to prayer. And so why is corporate prayer or praying together, why is it so important to us as believers and to the church as the whole? You know, why can't we just pray on our own? And why can't that be enough? Why do we have to pray together as a body of Christ? And so this morning I have three points. And as I said, I wanted to focus specifically on corporate prayer, right? Why is it so important that we pray together? And so the first point that I have is that corporate prayer unifies. Corporate prayer unifies. And so we know um, from this series, we know that God did not intend for us to live our life of faith alone, right? We weren't meant to live our life of faith alone, but what did He do? He designed and He created the church. All of us here, the collective body of believers, He created the church to continue on the work of Jesus here on earth. Amen? And so we are to work together to fulfill this calling that He has placed on us as the church. And as we see here in Acts 2, the early church was united in everything that they did. And so we know that unity within the church is something that needs to be valued, something that we should strive for. In John 17, verses 20 to 23, this is Jesus. He said, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all of those who will ever believe through their message. I pray that they will all be one. Just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And they may be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that your love, you love them as much as you love me. And so Jesus was praying for unity among his followers, his believers. And so how does, how does corporate prayer, how does praying together, how does that bring unity within the church? For one, when we pray together, right, whether it's here at church or at Bible study or, or wherever we may be, but when we pray together, we are gathering together, right? We have to be together in order to pray together. And so we are in each other's presence. We are, you know, physically there. We are in each other's presence. And so this allows us, when we meet together to pray, this allows us another opportunity for us to be able to fellowship. Another opportunity for us to build up our relationships with each other, to connect with one another. We are being present. Corporate prayer also unites us because uh, unifies us because it unites us in our faith. When we pray together, we are declaring as one body, as one church, we are declaring our faith in God. You see, our love for God and our faith in Him is the greatest thing that unites all of us believers. Amen? All of us as believers, the greatest thing that unites us is our love for God and our faith in Him. Thank you, sister. And so think about this, right? Think about when I say the church, I'm not only talking about us here at NLCF, but the, the capital C church, right? The global family of believers, the global community of believers in Jesus. And think about that. There's 
I have all of everyone who is a part of the church. We all come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different experiences, different perspectives. We live in different countries and have different cultures, speak different languages. But the one thing that unites us all is our faith in God. Amen. We are united in our love for God through and through the Holy Spirit. When we put our faith in God, there is more that unites us than that then divides us. Amen. We have more in common as believers than we do differences because of our faith. And so when we pray together, this is what happens. Barriers are removed between us. Differences are removed and we are united together. And when we pray together, we are declaring that our God is sovereign. We are declaring that He is able to do the impossible. That He can heal the sick. That He can deliver us from our struggles. Amen? When we seek God together and we are united in purpose and in solidarity, there is power. Things happen. Things change. God moves when we are united together in agreement and in solidarity when we come to God. And going back to Acts uh, one fourteen, where it says that they were united in prayer. The Greek word that is used here for united literally means one accord or one body or one mind. And so this means that when we pray together, we're not simply praying together as a group of individuals, but we are praying together as one. Amen? We're not praying as a group of individuals, but we are praying together as one, united in purpose, in mind, and in heart. When we pray together, think about this, right? When we pray together as a church, it is a visible expression of the unity that Jesus prayed for back in John. And so it unifies us. The second thing that corporate prayer or praying together does, it edifies. Amen? It edifies. So one of the purposes of the church and why we gather together is to edify one another. And so what does it mean to edify or edification? Right? We hear this word um, get used a lot within the church. So one of the purposes of the church is to edify one another. So what does this mean? To edify means to build up or strengthen or improve. All right? So to build up, to strengthen or improve. And so how do we edify one another within the church? We do this by teaching. We do this by encouraging. We use this by using our, our, the gifts that the, the Holy Spirit has given us. Amen? And so there are many different ways that we can build up one another, that we can encourage and help each other to, to, to grow and to improve. And so we have to recognize that church is full of broken and hurting people. Right? Is anyone here perfect? Is anyone here just experiencing nothing but good times in their lives and no trouble? No, right? The church is full of broken and hurting people. We all have our individual struggles in life. We all hit, you know, a a roadblock. We all hit that point in our life where we feel discouraged. But God designed the church to be a place where we can be encouraged, where we can be uplifted, where we can be built up and strengthened. And one of the ways that we do this is by praying for one another. Galatians 6, 2. It says, share each other's burdens. Amen? Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. And so when we gather together to pray, it gives us an opportunity, right? It gives us this opportunity to hear from our brothers and sisters within the church what they are going through. It gives us an opportunity for for us to hear what their burdens are. And it, it gives us an opportunity for us to share what our burdens are to them. And one of the best ways that we can help each other out within the church is to pray for one another. Never think that your prayer is insignificant or that it can't change things. Prayer is one of the best ways that we can help each other out. 
You see, what happens is when we pray, right? It says they're just sharing each other's burdens. When we pray, what we are doing is we are lightening the load off of our brother. We are lightening the load off of our sister from the burdens that they are carrying when we pray for them. James 5.16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And so James reaffirms this, right? When we are struggling with, with sin, we are to go to our brothers and sisters and have them pray for us, to seek prayer from them. Amen? And so that we could be delivered from it. You know, at my work, I work in a blue-collar job, and so there's a lot of physical work that I do and a lot of lifting, right? And, and so at our work, we're not allowed to lift or pick up anything that is more than 50 pounds. And I struggle just to lift up even the stuff that's 50 pounds, but we're not allowed, right? Our, our company policy is anything over 50 pounds, you have to have someone else help you, right? It's like, we call it like team lift and all that stuff. And so why do we do this? Why, why is that a policy? Why can't I go over there and lift up an 80-pound, you know, bag or 80-pound box? And we, they have, we have this, uh, you know, policy to what? Protect us, right? Because if you try to lift up that load of... 60, 70, 80, 100 pounds on your own, what's going to happen? You know, unless you're, you're like super strong or a bodybuilder, you're going to hurt yourself. It's going to cause damage to you. It's going to injure you even more. You're going to throw out your back or, 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 or anything else, right? It's so we, we can't, we're not allowed to lift that because we, we can bring injury upon ourselves. And so we have to have help. We have to help each other out at my work. And so it's the same thing when it comes to life. There are certain things, there are some things in our life that we weren't to, meant to carry on our own. There are things in life that we weren't meant to go through on our own. And those are our burdens, our struggles. We weren't meant to go through uh, our, those struggles in life alone. We weren't meant to carry the burdens that we have in our lives alone. Remember that God designed the church so that we can help one another out, amen? So that we can help our brother and sister lift up that load, or that burden that they are carrying so that they won't experience more hurt or more injury or more harm to their lives. We can't go through life and all of its burdens and hardships alone. We must rely on God and we must rely on our fellow believers to help us to lighten that load of burdens that we carry. And when we pray for each other, we're doing just that. When we pray for one another, we're helping our brother and sister lift up that load and that burden that they have. We let them know that they are not alone. When we pray for our brother and sister, we're letting them know that we have their back, that we're supporting them, that we care for them, that they're not going through this a struggle or this dark time in their life alone, but we are there sharing in their burden, battling that, temp helping them to battle that temptation and sin in their lives. And when we do this, when we pray for one another and help each other with our burdens, we are building up our bonds, we are building up our relationships, they are strengthened, but we are also strengthening our faith and our trust in God. Amen? And the third thing, the third thing that, uh, or, or importance of corporate prayer, praying together, is that it brings cooperation. It brings cooperation, amen? And so as I said, whenever we pray, whenever we pray, we are aligning ourselves to, with, with the, for, for the perspective of who God is in our lives, right? So when we pray, we are aligning ourselves with God and His will. When we pray, we are surrendering, surrendering ourselves to Him. We are placing our requests, our, our, our needs in our lives, and we are placing them where? In God's hands. When we pray together in agreement, we are cooperating and working alongside God to fulfill His will. Think about this, right? When we pray... We are abandoning our own will. We are abandoning our own desires and, and what we want in our lives. And we are staying together as a church. God, your will be done 
and use me to help fulfill it. Amen? When we pray together, that's what we're saying. We're abandoning all of whatever our own desires and we are placing it in God's hands and saying, God, your will be done and use us to fulfill it. Now, how many of us here believe that there is power when the church is united in prayer? All right, three of you. Amen. There is power when the church is united in prayer. Amen. When we are united in purpose, when we are in agreement with one another in faith, and when we pray, this is what happens, church. Miracles take place. Walls come down. Sicknesses are are, are healed. People are delivered. The impossible happens. Demons flee. Darkness turns to light, and so on and so forth. This is what happens when we are united and pray together. When we are united in prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit is unleashed and we are given the spiritual authority to do what? To do God's will. Now I want us to look at the, the, the early church again. They didn't stop praying after Acts chapter 2. In Acts 4 verse 31, and this is just a quick uh, uh, of uh, context of what's going on here. The, the, the early believers just hear word, right, that the, the religious authorities are, are going to start persecuting them. They're going to start arresting them and, and you know, throwing them in jail and, and, and persecuting them. And this is what happens. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. After they heard all this bad news, it says, After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now think about that. If we were sitting here and somebody came in here and told all of us here, you know, whoever's going to come in here, they're going to arrest you all, they're going to kill us all, throw us all in jail. What did the church do? Did they run away? No, it says that they prayed. And because they were united in prayer, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they still went out there preaching the word of God with boldness. Amen? Another one, Acts chapter 12, verse 5 through 8. And there's some real quick context. Peter was in prison. Or P- Peter was in prison, and so the early church was praying for Peter. It says here, but while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. And once again, we see the power when we pray together. The early church prayed for Peter. It says that they prayed together earnestly. And what happened? The chains fell off and he was released from prison. Amen? Amen. And so through through prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the early church was able to cooperate with God and for his will to be done. It was God's will for them to preach the gospel, and through prayer, they were able to do it, even in the face of persecution. It was God's will for Peter to be out of jail, and through their prayer, he was released from jail. Amen? And so I want to make it real quick before we we close. I want to make it clear, right? This power that comes when we pray together, it's the same power that we have when we pray individually, right? Right? We can change the world. We can see miracles by praying individually. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, in corporate prayer, this is the only time that God will move, right? God can move with our own personal prayer. But what I'm saying is that that our prayer, uh, or what I'm saying is that when we pray together collectively as a church, and we, we come before God and we submit ourselves to Him, we, are, we can see a greater impact, right? we can see a great impact, not only in our communities, but within the world. We're saying when we pray together, we're telling God that we want to cooperate with Him in seeing His will done. When we are praying together as a church, we are saying, God, we want to take on this challenge. We want to fight this battle. 
We want to intercede for this community. We want to preach and be the light in this community, even in the face of persecution. When we pray together, as I said, we can see the Holy Spirit move. Amen. We, we can pray together for all of these things. We can even pray together for God to send revival. Amen? All of these things are God's will. And I want to focus on revival because this is something that I believe the church needs desperately. Amen? And we believe that revival is God's will. And so when you look at, you know, revivals throughout history, they had one common starting point. One common starting point was that in these meetings there was prayer. There was prayer. Now, a couple of months ago when we were in L.A., it was like at, my wife and I went out to dinner, and after we were going uh, back uh, to uh, my sister-in-law's house, I, I asked her if we could go to this area of downtown L.A., and it was like 11 o'clock at night, and it was kind of, if you're familiar with downtown L.A., you know where Skid Row is, right? It's not a very nice area, but I wanted to go to this place in downtown L.A. called Azusa Street. Now, how, how many have heard of the, the Azusa Street Revival? Hey man, oh, you can see, we got, <laughs> we got to learn about the Azusa Street Revival. But when I, I'm talking about revival, but there's this place in downtown LA called Azusa Street. Back in 1906, a group of believers gathered at this church in Azusa Street for a prayer meeting. And they were seeking God there. They were praying together earnestly, united. And what happened here at Azusa Street in 1906 was the Azusa Street Revival. At this meeting, because of their, their prayer and they were seeking God and united in prayer, the Holy Spirit fell in this place. The Azusa Street Revival, this, is, this was considered to be the starting point of the Pentecostal and the Charismatic Movement. And I wanted to see this place for myself because this is where a revival that took place and a fire that was set, that spread throughout the world. And so for all of us here and, and for Pentecostals and Charismatics around the world, we can all trace, you know, our, 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 our spiritual lineage, I guess, to this one revival back in 1906 in downtown Illinois. And from this revival, from this prayer meeting, as I said, this movement spread throughout the world, and now there are over 600 million people who have come to faith through the Pentecostal and Charismatic Movement. Amen? 600 million. And the Pentecostal and Charismatic Movement is the fastest growing denomination in Christianity. And why? It's because I believe it's, you know, the Holy Spirit is working and moving, right? And, and, and just think about this, right? And I, I want, you know, I might be going off on a tangent, but I want us to think about this. Because a group of people gathered together in downtown LA to pray from this movement, Millions came to know Christ. Millions, including ourselves here, came to, to know Christ, and it's continuing to spread. The gospel is continuing to spread around the world. That's what it means. That's what can happen, church, when we pray together. That is the power that can be unleashed when we pray together, when we are united and we align ourselves and submit ourselves to God's will. When we come together and say, God, we submit ourselves to you, and we want to cooperate with you, we want to take part in your will, in your plan, and so, and, and so that we can also witness all the things that he can do. Amen? I invite us all to, to stand this morning as we close, and if we have the worship team come up. And as we close, I want us to reflect uh, once again on the importance of corporate prayer and praying together. And not only that, but everything else that we've learned throughout this month.